What do you know about Marie Antoinette? That she lost her head in the French Revolution? And what do you remember about that head? Most likely, her outrageous poofed and powdered hairdos. In fact, Marie Antoinette has remained a cultural icon for centuries because of the daring style she brought to 18th century France. And for the better part of the Queen's reign, one man was entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring that her coiffure was at its most ostentatious best. Who was this minister of fashion who wielded such tremendous influence over the Queen? Marie Antoinette's head, the royal hairdresser, the Queen, and the Revolution charts the rise of Léonard Autier from humble beginnings as a country barber in the south of France to the inventor of the poof and the premier hairdresser to the Queen. Because as everyone knows, there's no one closer to a woman than her hairdresser. By unearthing a variety of sources from the 18th and 19th centuries, including memoirs, court documents, and archived periodicals, author Will Basher tells Lenore's mostly unknown story, chronicling his background, the role he played in the life of his most famous client, and the chaotic, history-making world in which he rose to prominence. Besides his proximity to the Queen, Lenore had a fascinating life filled with seduction. After all, he was the only man in a female-dominated court. Intrigue, espionage, treason, exile, and possibly execution. Lenore was born in the medieval town of Pamiers in 1751, the son of Alexis Otier and Catherine Frenier, both domestic servants. At an early age, Lenore knew he would never find his fortune in the sciences or in government, but he was confident that he could take advantage of his two talents, charisma and artistic genius. Greedy for golden fame, he wrote in his memoirs, I may very well decide the destiny of my whole life with just a single stroke of my comb. Lenore would have been trained in the art of hairdressing in the mid-1760s in Montpellier and Bordeaux, where he first practiced his craft. But his creative genius was lost on matronly ladies of these provincial cities. To find his fame and fortune, the young coiffer needed to take Paris by storm. Having made the long journey from Bordeaux, Lenore arrived in Paris on summer's evening in 1769 after an arduous day of traveling. He was tired. He wrote in his journal, but one couldn't tell. His only luggage was a big bundle of vanity, which would not allow him to admit that he had just covered some 120 miles in two weeks on foot. Lenore noticed that Parisian men dressed according to their rank, wearing small wigs to which they applied powder. Men of higher society wore waistcoats with breeches that reached down to their calves. Stockings were then held up with garters buckled just below the knee. Men of lower ranks normally dressed in the clothes discarded by the wealthier classes. Only the cleanliness of the clothes spoke the difference. A young man's poverty follows him wherever he goes, according to a French proverb. But Lenore's rise in the European capital of manners and fashion would hinge on his ability to conform to a certain aesthetic, or at least preserve the illusion of it. Unable to afford powder, Lenore styled his hair and whitened it with a billowing gust of flour. With his fine gray waistcoat brushed until it shined and the folds of his tie artistically arranged, he pulled his tightly drawn stockings up to show the calves of his legs. Now, he could surely be taken for a gentleman. If he wasn't quite there yet, he was destined to become one soon enough. After all, Paris awaited him. What Lenore didn't know, however, was that hairdressing was highly regulated by the Parisian Guild. So, how could Lenore bypass the master hairdresses of the capital city? To answer this, we begin with the theory behind the art of coiffure. According to the manuals of the time, cutting hair was the science of giving natural hair its form by removing irregularities in length and cropping in stages, all the while enhancing the face, the true art of the hairdresser. Therefore, to practice hairdressing, the coiffure would cut the hair according to the client's features and then finish by curling and powdering. The professional, always male coiffeur would start by combing the entire head of hair to remove any tangles. Then, using his wood, tortoiseshell, or gold comb, he would begin at the top of the head and comb one portion or row at a time, combing straight down or to the side, depending on whether the hair was to be cut straight or angled. 
When the comb was near the end of the hair, the hair underneath the comb was cut with half-closed scissors. Cutting the hair to the desired length was continued with the rest of the hair, but the top rows of hair were required to be shorter than the lower rows. Hairdressing tools were purchased from roaming haberdashers in the 18th century. Clients included wig makers as well as hairdressers. When styling a wig, one would follow the same rules that govern natural hair. Care had to be taken not to cut the wig too short so that it would completely cover all the natural hair below. After the hair was properly cut, one wrapped the hair in curling papers, heated the packets with curling irons, and finished with powder. This process required special instruments and materials used in a precise manner. First, small pieces of paper were cut into triangles, preferably using gray paper or blotting paper because they tear easily. Gathering a small portion of the hair with the comb and holding it with the first two fingers of one hand around the middle, the coiffeur would roll the hair in a curl and immediately envelop it with the curling paper. This was the loop curl. Another type of curl was the crepe, which was preferable for short hair on top of the head. The crepe was created by taking the strand of hair and twisting it in the curling paper to avoid the hole found in the middle of the loop curl. Once the whole head was covered with rolling papers, it was time to use the curling irons. The coiffeur used two kinds. One was to clip with two flat jaws of equal thickness and the other resembled scissors. The irons were heated in the fire. The desired temperature was achieved if the iron did not scorch a curling paper or by testing heat near the cheek. When ready, the curling papers were heated by the iron for a few moments. Another iron would be heated while curling since the irons did not hold their heat too long. With a full head of curling papers, it was necessary to heat several irons. Once the curling papers were cooled, they were removed and the locks of curled hair then combed together. The coiffeur would gracefully arrange the curls around the forehead and temples. If needed, the curling iron resembling scissors could reinforce any unwieldy curls. The only task left was to powder the hair. The best powder was made of wheat flour and was kept in an iron cup or sheepskin pouch. The best poofs were made with long bristles from the top of the heads of geese. To powder, the coiffeur coated his hands with pomade and lightly waxed the curls. Then, he lightly dipped his puff in the powder. This small quantity was sufficient for dusting the hair and highlighting the cuts and curls. For fear that the clients would get powder on their face and in their eyes, the coiffeur took precaution of protecting them with a mask. Generally petite and arranged close to the head, the tête de mouton, or sheep's head, style was particularly popular at the time and was characterized by soft curls with little or no height. This style can be seen in many of Madame Pompadour's portraits. The Tête de Mouton received its name during the reign of Louis XIV, one day when the king was hunting with one of his ladies of the court. Her hair became disheveled during the chase, so he pulled it back and secured it with her garter, securing the bed of the king that night as well. This traditional style, featuring defined twists of curls that were arranged in rows across the front and top of the head, was popular throughout Europe and commonly included a pom-pom or an ornament such as small ribbons, pearls, jewels, flowers, or decorative pins styled together. This was named a pom-pom after Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour. These delicate and demure styles that framed the face were the fashion of the time that is, until Lenore arrived. Lenore got his start when vaudeville actress Julie Niebuhr asked him to style her as a fairy for a pantomime one evening. Lenore's creation was an outlandish diversion, but the means he used, and to which he perhaps one day would owe his fame and fortune, were rather simple. He fastened stars to a circle of extremely fine wire, and to this he attached two pieces of the same wire that he fixed in the hair. The golden stars seemed to arch themselves as a crown on his fairy's head without any visible attachment. From two steps away, he wrote, my illusion was complete. 
Lenore could not believe Julie's delight when she saw the contraption that he had just erected on her head. This petite dancer had received very little praise for her work on the stage up to this time. According to the reviews, she had been somewhat awkward in her gestures and showed little grace in her motion. That very night, however, things changed for the fairy. She became an overnight success, and things changed for Lenore, too. Carriages filled with aristocratic ladies lined up in front of the theater to catch a glimpse of his creation. Soon, he was styling the hair of women of the nobility, including the king's new mistress, Madame du Barry, and by 1772, he had become the hairstylist of the young Dauphine Marie Antoinette. Lenore, often taken for nobility, would enter Marie Antoinette's private salon at Versailles soon after her entourage of ladies-in-waiting dressed her. It was through the queen that Lenore achieved his success and fame. But it could also be said that Lenore was indirectly responsible for the very first attacks upon the iconic queen found in inflammatory pamphlets circulating as early as 1775. The attacks were prompted by Lenore's incredible and increasingly fantastical hairstyles, concoctions that would reach such a height that it was necessary for ladies to kneel on the carriage floor or hold the towering hair pieces outside the coach windows en route to gala balls in the opera. Noble ladies of the court of Versailles felt obliged to imitate the queen's new and daring hairstyles. Despite the danger of becoming burning infernos when they brushed against the candles of the palace chandeliers, the young ladies of Paris were also enthralled with the new fangled trends, drastically increasing their coiffure expenses and incurring large debts. Mothers and husbands grumbled, family fights ensued, and many relationships were irreparably damaged. In all, the general consensus of the French people was well publicized. The queen was bankrupting all the women of France, financially and morally. The escalation can be tracked to one evening. Lenore Oti unexpectedly received then Princess Marie Antoinette's request for her signature elaborate coiffure for the opera one evening. It would be a risky endeavor because he was a bit tipsy. While he slowly separated the princess's hair, attempting to conjure something magical, he no doubt was battling the thumping arteries of his temples. Fortunately, panic gave way to inspiration, and within an hour, his flock of curls was able to hold three white ostrich plumes set on the left side of her head and fastened in the middle of a rosette he had braided with her hair. A bow of pink ribbon, in the center of which was a large ruby, held the elaborate creation together. Marie Antoinette examined it in silence. For a moment, the princess appeared somewhat disappointed, but this frown lasted only an instant, when, like a flash, her face lit up with delight. Oh, Lenore, it must be over a yard high! Lenore agreed that the arrangement was daring, but he ventured that there would be 200 hairstyles higher than hers in Paris by the following evening. Her subjects thronged to catch a glimpse of the elaborate hairstyles he created, and as he predicted, they soon spared no expense to imitate them. The fervor spread to all of Europe. And then, Marie Antoinette's milliner, the celebrated Mademoiselle Bertin, invented a hairdo called the Kezako, or what is it, coiffure. It was composed of three feathers that ladies wore on the back of the head, creating a design resembling a question mark, and it became the next sensation. Lenore was very fond of Mademoiselle Burton, often commenting that their fortunes trudged along hand in hand like two good sisters. But Lenore was jealous. In fact, Mademoiselle Burton's laurels and praise were beginning to prevent Lenore from sleeping at night. He needed just one more of those grand ideas, one that would overthrow all existing vogues, not only to win back the favor of the Dauphine and assuage his bitterness at Mademoiselle Rose, but to keep his name on the tongues of Paris. After many sleepless nights, Lenore finally came up with a new sensation, the Pouf Sentimental. It was the spirit of rivalry with Mademoiselle Rose that brought these headdresses to such monstrous heights, both literally and figuratively. The Pouf was first worn by Madame the Duchess of Chartres in the month of April 1774. 
the Duchess's poof was composed of 14 yards of gauze and numerous plumes waving at the top of a tower. Lenore employed two waxen figures as ornaments, representing the little Duke of Bijolet in his nurse's arms. Beside them, he placed a parrot pecking at a plate of cherries and reclining at the nurse's feet. He put the waxen figure of a little African boy of whom the Duchess was very fond. The new poof was quite unprecedented. Never had anyone dared to create such a hodgepodge. Even Lenore was a bit frightened to show the absurd conception at first. But, like most of his creations, it caught on swiftly. Soon afterward, one could find the strangest things in the poofs of Paris. Frivolous women covered their heads with butterflies. Sentimental women nestled swarms of cupids in their hair. And the wives of officers wore squadrons perched on their heads. Melancholic women went so far as to put crematory urns in their headdresses. It was also not uncommon to mix feathers with flowers, which were kept fresh in tiny bottles of water hidden in the poof. And the hairstyles continued to rise in height. In February 1776, the queen, going to a ball given by the Duchess of Orleans, had plumes so high that they had to be removed from her coiffure to get into her carriage. She had to leave them behind when she returned to Versailles. The next popular poof, the Harazone, or the Hedgehog, was Lenore's concoction of unpowdered hair curled to the tips and rising in tears, leaving several strands of curls falling on the neck. The hair on the forehead was held up in a high, very large clump with hairpins. The bouffant style was supported by a ribbon that encircled the entire poof. Then came the zephyr. Lenore continued to invent new styles, each more extravagant than the next. Some were so high that it appeared that a woman's head was in the middle of her body. Another incredible creation consisted of a ship sailing on a sea of thick, wavy hair. It was invented after the naval battle in which the frigate, La Belle Poule, was victorious. The ship itself, with its masts, rigging, and guns, was imitated in the miniature on the poof. This elaborate creation, a celebration of sorts, was an overnight success. It should be noted, however, that many such coifs were supported with wired scaffolding and were very heavy. Also, seldom washed in making sleep difficult, these powdered concoctions were commonly breeding grounds for all types of vermin. By the time Queen Marie Antoinette had given France its first heir to the throne, she was threatened by the increasing loss of her hair. At the first indication of this catastrophe, Lenore began to tremble. Along with the hair of Marie Antoinette, Lenore would lose his power, that supremacy enabling him to open up the hearts of the ladies of Paris and the court, as well as their purses. So, what to do? Lenore persuaded the queen that his new coiffeur, Al Enfant, would meet the same enthusiasm as her previous coiffeurs. The queen's beautiful hair fell under Lenore's scissors, and within two weeks, all the ladies of the court had their hair cut short à l'enfant, creating yet a new era in hairdressing. While the queens of France were always of foreign birth for political reasons, Marie Antoinette was a princess from Austria, France's longtime enemy. Although it was vital for her to appear as French as possible, her fashions and hairstyles increasingly alienated her subjects. Attacks on the queen's hair were soon followed by damaging accusations, ranging from sexual promiscuity to high treason. When incest was added to the list, the revolutionary court was able to finally make its case to condemn the queen to death. The second volume of Will Basher's Marie Antoinette trilogy, Marie Antoinette's Darkest Day, Prisoner Number 280 in the Conciergerie, begins on the 2nd of August, 1793, the day Marie Antoinette was torn from her family's arms and escorted from the temple to the Conciergerie, a thick-walled fortress turned prison. It was also known as the waiting room for the guillotine, because prisoners only spent a day or two here before their conviction and subsequent execution. The ex-queen surely knew her days were numbered, but she could not have known that two and a half months would pass before she would finally stand trial and be convicted of the most ungodly charges. Author Basher traces the final days of the prisoner registered only as Widow Capet, number 280, a time that was a cruel mixture of grandeur, humiliation, and terror. 
Marie Antoinette's reign amidst the splendors of the court of Versailles is a familiar story, but her final imprisonment in a fetid, dank dungeon is a little-known coda to a once-charmed life. Her 76 days in this terrifying prison could only be described as the most horrific in the fallen queen's life, vividly recaptured in this richly researched history. Lenore Otier, her celebrated and loyal hairdresser, was an exile in Germany when the executioner arrived at Marie Antoinette's prison cell, scissors in hand, on that chilly October morning in 1793. He tied her hands behind her back and, roughly grasping her hair, cut off the iconic locks that Lenore had made so legendary. Minutes later, the executioner would exhibit the severed queen's head to the crazed crowds at the foot of the scaffold. Nothing but the continuous roar of Viva la Nation could be heard as he held it up victoriously by her hair. And so ended the life of Marie Antoinette, but not her legacy and influence on the world of fashion. Marie Antoinette, with the help of Monsieur Lenoir and Mademoiselle Rose, revamped fashion in Paris and in the grand capitals of Europe. Her stunning, glamorous costumes and avant-garde poof hairstyle made her the fashion pioneer of the 18th century. The fashion icon and trendsetter of her time also used the yard-high poofs to tower above her weak, incompetent husband, Louis XVI. It was a pure power play in the French kingdom to be sure. Marie Antoinette's style still inspire artists and designers today. Madonna stole the stage at the MTV Video Music Awards in 1990 with an immaculate poof hairstyle. Two decades later, Karl Lagerfeld rocked the Palace of Versailles with the Chanel Cruz 2013 collection. Marie Antoinette's timeless and playful tone resonated in the pastel-colored fringe and frothy lace ruffles and cuffs of the Chanel signature designs. But Lagerfeld was not the first to showcase his designs at the Queen's magnificent chateau. Marie Antoinette herself would have been delighted by John Galliano's 2000 Christian Duar Masquerade and Bondage Collection. It was a smorgasbord of rich silks, puffed tulles, ostrich feathers, scented flowers, enormous crystals, and tiny corsets. Did Marie Antoinette establish herself as a force to be reckoned with? As a queen who commanded as much attention as the most dazzling king or any of his pampered mistresses? If so, then Lagerfeld and Galliano have shown us what the trendsetter Marie Antoinette could have shown us on the runways of Versailles Hall of Mirrors, if she had lived in our era. Author Will Basher's trilogy is a fresh and insightful look at one of the world's most fascinating and timeless personalities whose sense of style and self-indulgence in many ways presaged both the best and worst of our own era. Marie Antoinette's Head, Darkest Days and World are available on Amazon, other online retailers, and through the author's website, willbasher.com.